Uh, welcome everyone to low slope roofing troubleshooting in advance. Um, as you guys know, I've spent a, a fair number of years at BOA, a lot of which I did a lot of our warranty and handyman repairs. And during those repairs, I got to learn a number of things that I know don't work. And so when we talk about low slope roofing, uh, as you know, my job now is I go around to our ongoing jobs and help the subcontractors, the project managers, and even all the way back up through the process to the designers to try to make sure that we can get these things done so that we skip these spots that we know will fail down the road. So we call that troubleshooting in advance. And this is our uh, presentation on low slope roofing. So what do we mean by low slope roofing? Um, low slope roofing, we're gonna talk about materials. We're gonna talk about uh, common problems. We're gonna talk about better and worse designs, which is important and uh, the best details, which a lot of us in the field will be in charge of making sure they get executed correctly. So low slope is a slope that's under four inches and 12 inches run. So a four inch uh, rise uh, will work with regular shingles, regular skylights, regular metal roofing. Most of those things are all designed to work at a four inch rise or more. And, uh, <clears throat> Excuse me for a second. Um, standing seam roofing, certain types, you can go down to 3 and 12. And there's some skylights that you can now go down to a 3 and 12 pitch. But anything below that, you have to use really special materials. Uh, you can't just use the regular stuff. So we're talking about membrane, soldered, 100% waterproof roofing when you get down below 312. Um, one thing that I definitely have learned uh, is really worthwhile is uh, that there are manuals. Um, the Copper Development Association has a manual for copper roofing. The Sheet Metal uh, Association has one for all different kinds of metal roofing. Um, the manufacturers of membrane roofing have books full of details. So these manuals are great. And whenever we come to something where we're scratching our head, that's the first place I turn. And there's usually a good detail for how it's supposed to be done. Uh, and those manuals are based on you know, decades and decades of experience, things that have failed, they learn to put something else in there. So they're really worthwhile to check out. All right, so there's a few sections to our presentation. The first one is materials. And I think this is important because certain materials have se serious limitations. And we should know what those are before we're selecting which one we want to use. Or if a client wants to change for some reason, you got to be able to explain to them which ones they could change to and which ones they can't. So we need to know how they work. So with metal, there's copper, stainless, and aluminum and steel. Um, copper and stainless can be soldered. Aluminum and steel pretty much can't. There, there's an old type of steel that used to be around that could be soldered, but it's really not used anymore, uh, partly because it was coated in lead and partly because it's not inexpensive. It's hard to work anyway. So the key thing with metal roofing is that metal roofs that aren't fully soldered will leak. So I'm up on this roof taking this picture because the roof is leaking. And this is one of the places where it was leaking the end of the standing seam. Um, as Joe Sieberak put it, all metal roofs leak some. So if you fold pieces of metal together and you have good slope and the water's running away, you can make it so it won't leak under most conditions. But as soon as the wind starts blowing or as relevant for today, when you get the slope down low, then water will start working its way through the joints. So <clears throat> uh, here's an example of this, uh, a house that we did in the 90s that I did. Um, has a one in 12 slope at the top. And that's me on my ladder. Why am I on that roof? Because it's leaking. It was a standing seam roof. Yep. Standing seam roof installed at a one in 12 pitch did not leak until the gutters were full of, you know, four inches of ice above the top of the gutter, uh, which you can see in this picture. Um, I don't know if you can see down here in this area, there's a, uh, uh, oops. You can see the seam. But then out at the edge, you can't see it because it's buried. You know, the ice was well above the top of the seam. So that open end of the seam and even the actual seam itself, water could get up through that once you filled up the water level up to above the top of the seam. So this is why a standing seam metal roof will let water in. Uh, in this case, we didn't have good protection under it, so it leaked. Uh, we fixed that by taking off the bottom six feet of the roof and doing a fully soldered roof from there down with ice and water shield and everything under it. And that fixed it. 
Um, so another really important thing with metals is that they move a lot. So this is a, a fairly well done roof. It's a copper roof. You can see the pans are pretty small. Uh, in the copper books, 18 by 24 is the maximum size pans for a fully soldered roof. I think these are a little bigger, but they're not that big. The issue with this particular roof and the reason why I'm up there, uh, it runs about 30 feet in one direction. So the copper shrinks a lot. In fact, it shrank so much that it actually literally ripped the copper open during an ice storm. Um, I, I was uh, actually, it was on a Saturday. I was working on someone else's house, helping them put their closet doors in, one of, our, one of my coworkers, and I uh, got a phone call. I had to, had to stop doing my good deed and run over and deal with a leaky roof. Um, so how much does it move? Well, in the DC area, when the sun shines on a dark metal roof, it'll heat it up a lot, right? 70 or 80 degrees higher than the air temperature. And then in the nighttime, the black sky absorbs heat out of dark surfaces. So a dark surface facing the sky will actually get much colder than the ambient air around it. So in our area, you're talking about 170 degrees different between a hot day and summer sun and a cold night in the winter. And that's about 3 eighths of an inch of movement in 10 feet. So that 30 foot roof was an inch less copper than when it was put down. And that's why it ripped. So the way to get around that is to put in movement joints. But that can be really complicated in a remodeling situation. It's an important thing to know. And the other important thing is to make sure the pans are the small size. So this is some, uh, someone's idea of a roof. They took three foot wide sheets of lead coated copper, cut them into four foot pieces, and then soldered those together three foot by four foot. And every single seam on this entire roof cracked because the metal movement was too much for the strength of the solder joints. So that's why they ask you to use the small pans. This is another example. This is a before picture, um, the house where a tree knocked the top of the house off. And we redid the top. Yep. And uh, they, they kind of tried. They, the pans are a little bit bigger than they should be. There's some issues with some of the joints in the main part of the roof. But the real issue is the 10 foot long edge metal pieces, uh, all the joints between those ripped open. And uh, if you read in the sheet metal book, it says that joints in valleys and in edge metal are require maintenance. And that basically means this joint's gonna fail. So you really need to have good material under this. You know, we, we should have run ice and water under this whole thing and over the edge in such a way that when those joints failed, it would just hit the ice and water. But uh, this was a leak. So that's one of the key things with copper. Um, you got to keep, keep plan the thing out for movement and make sure you have a backup. So again, uh, if we're under a 3 or 412, we're not going to use standing seam. You got to fully solder everything. Go ahead. Uh, so if we put ice and water shield underneath the whole roof uh -huh. and it fails uh, and it doesn't leak, but it's continually getting moist and freezing and thawing and uh, how do we kind of address that part of it? Well, my recommendation is not to use metal at all, but I don't think that that's going to be an issue as long as there's slope under everything. The water will just come out at the bottom. Yeah. Um, so copper is not foolproof. You got to be careful with it. Uh, read the manuals and put in the required joints. Actually, this, this is a, uh, a movement joint in the middle of this large roof. So that's kind of what it looks like, but you have to plan that, right? You can't have a valley or a gutter going through the middle of that movement joint. So stainless steel, this isn't used as much these days. There was a big supply interruption. The company that made the stainless went out of business in the recession, and they're just getting the material back on the market. But uh, it turns out it's very hard to solder anyway. It's, there are really no advantages to it over copper. Um, it's actually more expensive and it seems to have some of the same issues. Steel moves a little bit less than copper, but I'm not sure it's really a great product at the end of the day. So the aluminum and steel that's really on the market is all painted material and you can't solder it. So you really can't, you shouldn't really use it under a 312. Um, let me just talk about this really quick though. There are directions from Peterson, um, which is a big aluminum and steel company. You can use their material to do a, a roof at a 112 slope. And I'll show you some pictures of that. Um, you know, it's just hard to actually do. So here's, here's a roof we did, which, some of it's at a, as low as a 112 slope. 
and uh, we covered the whole thing with ice and water shield, so that's good. Um, the way it's supposed to work is you put the valley metal down. Then you run ice and water shield all the way down the whole roof and stick it to the top of the valley metal. And then you put this hook bead, these pieces here that are loose, on top of that, and you hook the standing seam pans onto that. So it sounds simple, and when you look at the drawings, you're like, oh yeah, I can see how this would work. But then when you start putting it together in a remodeling situation, you know, here's, here, this is that same area. We stuck the stuff on, then we realized, oh wait, the valley isn't going to cover this. We had to peel it off of the painted finished roof. The, this whole thing where it connects to the brick is really sketchy. You know, these, all these, these three-dimensional shapes that are supposed to be made waterproof by the stickiness of the ice and water shield. So we ended up thinking it was kind of a pain. Um, this is an example or a picture of the standing seam. It comes with a really neat sealant in it. So it's supposed to be once you fold it all together, the sealant is pinched between the two panels. And I think it probably would be hard to get water around that sealant through the top. But at each end, there's a big gap from the top of the seam down. And you're supposed to caulk that. But every time those pans change size, it's going to, you know, when they get smaller, it's going to pull the seams open. And I just don't really think that's going to stay watertight. So the ice and water shield is really the watertight part. And it was really hard to execute. Um, it was a lot of labor. It was a lot of work. Uh, at the end of the day, I think we actually should have done something different, membrane or copper. Didn't, didn't really save money. So overall, uh, I know metal has a, has a very good reputation. But on a low slope roof, I think it's very questionable. It's really hard to have a great design uh, and great execution. Um, there's maintenance required. It's just not necessarily, it doesn't work out as well as you might have thought. Go ahead. Has, uh, has techniques, with like, let's say copper, for instance, mm -hmm. have techniques changed so much over the years that they're, they're fairly now more than, let's say, a house that's 100 years old that has copper from way back when that's perhaps as a new? I've never seen a 100-year-old copper roof is the first thing I'll say. Um, I do think it's hard to get good workmanship in our area. Um, and particularly in roofing, it's one of the trades that has the highest turnover. I mean, it's a very hard work. People's bodies wear out, and there just aren't that many old roofers with a lot of experience. So copper has been around that long? Like, well, they sort of used it, but it wasn't in common use around here. I mean, copper itself wears out eventually. So I've never seen a really old copper roof. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure it's that awesome. But anyway. That's my opinion on metal is it's not necessarily that durable. It is very hard to do. So that brings us to the next material I'd like to talk about, single ply membranes. Um, these are what we use a lot. Uh, they work, you know, they're, they're very flexible. They don't have issues with freeze thaw. Um, they're the least expensive materials and they work really well. Uh, the sheet themselves, like a sheet of EPDM, it's impossible for water to get through that unless you drop a tree branch through it, right? I mean, it's good material. The only possible issues is seams, connections, and penetrations, which we have a lot of on every roof. And I'll talk a lot about those in the second half of this. So uh, real quick on EPDM, it's, it is very strong and durable material. The sheet itself will last 20 to 50 years, depending on how much sun you get on it and how thick you buy. Um, one of the really important things we've learned is to always buy the, uh, always use the seam tape, which is just an adhesive that you put on the bottom sheet and then glue the top sheet with. It's much better than trying to do a field glue seam. And then it's really important to do what's called a, a lap seal or a cap seal. Every joint, you use a sealant that protects that, the edge of the joint from getting water in it. Because the, the real issue with EPDM, uh, the joints have to be maintained, is that water will get into the joints and freeze thaw the glue joints apart. So if you can't access the roof and check the lap sealant, then you're, you're going to have trouble down the road. And these roofs have to be checked out every few years. One other thing that's important is that it's not compatible with asphalt, which should be easy to deal with. But in practice, a lot of roofers have a lot of asphalt products in their trucks. And it's, you know, a lot of other people do too. It's hard to, hard to make sure you're separated from asphalt all the time. So uh, another material we've been using a lot of lately is TPO. Uh, and uh, that is, uh, comes in colors that our clients seem to prefer. A lot of them don't like the black EPDM. Um, and uh, it's put together with uh, heat seaming. 
So you use a, a special heat gun, you warm it up, and it actually melts the two pieces together. So if that joint is done correctly with enough heat and they do the joint right, it's a really durable joint. You can't freeze thaw that apart. It really becomes one piece. So uh, you can do the joints wrong, but uh, luckily the guys we work with are really good and we haven't had any issues with that. Um, if you want to attach it to metal, they make metal with a special paint that you can heat melt to, and that's the best seam. Um, if you don't use the special metal, you have to glue it, and that isn't as durable. And uh, it's more compatible with asphalt than EPDM is. So that's good. Um, makes it easier to deal with stuff. OK, uh, another type of membrane roof is uh, PVC. It's another white plastic material. Um, it bonds with the heat gun. Um, a couple of things I've learned about PVC is that PVC itself isn't UV resistant. Um, it's not very strong, it's not very flexible. So to make a strong, flexible, UV resistant piece of PVC, they have to add all kinds of um, kind of questionable chemicals which end up leaching out over time. So PVC fails just because the softeners in it leave it or the UV resistors stop working. And the softeners and the UV resistant chemicals are pretty bad chemicals. So overall, um, I would stick with TPO. Um, you also can't use this with asphalt. Um, you know, I just think PVC is a very questionable material myself, although we haven't had any issues with the one or two roofs we did that architects uh, really wanted us to use that material. So I guess time will tell, but from what I understand, it's probably pretty questionable. Um, one other interesting thing with these single ply membranes, um, most of the companies that make it have different sets of details for different warranty lengths. And there's the 15 and 20 year details and the 25 and 30 year details. So when you're flipping through the books, you can really see like this one must work better because they'll give you a twice as long a warranty as this one. So I think that's, that's kind of interesting. It's the same details for the longer roof uh, warranties. Um, unfortunately, no warranties on our roofs. Those are only for commercial. But the details, um, you can really tell how good they are by, by reading that. So the third t general type of roofing is stuff that's applied hot, torched down, uh, or built up roofing. And uh, as far as built up roofing, that's when you have a tar heater and you pour buckets of hot tar and put felt in it. I've never ever seen that done on a residential roof in DC. Uh, I'm not even sure it's done commercially much anymore. Um, it's uh, for a variety of reasons. But we do see this torch down every once in a while. It was really popular in the early 90s and then a few buildings got burned down by people torching it down and then no one could get insurance and everybody stopped using it. It's kind of back on the market. There's, um, they came up with a protocol for using the torches that seems to work pretty well. Very few buildings get burned down. Uh, but anyway, it's the old gold standard. Two layers of modified bitumen roofing is uh, a very durable uh, roof that's very reliable. So, uh, you know, I, once this roof was done and we hadn't burned the house down, I slept very well knowing that we had the double layer uh, on, the, on top of it. Um, it is asphalt. It's very compatible with asphalt. Um, you know, it's a heavy, expensive roof, but it's good stuff. Um, other than burning down our clients' houses, there's no real issue with it. Um, okay. Lisa, when you say it's not compatible with asphalt, so if you had a shingle roof above and then that's to thick on down on top of the ones that aren't compatible, it's going to wear and do damage. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. So when they say it's not compatible, what they mean is the asphalt, the chemicals in the asphalt will damage the chemicals in the roofing. So if you were to take uh, like asphalt roofing cement that's just full of the solvents and the actual, you know, the asphalt itself and smear that on EPDM, it'll destroy the EPDM. Um, when you put shingles on top, the shingles, the asphalt is really pretty much bound up inside of it. Not, it doesn't have a lot of the solvents in it. So it, it used to be that they said you can't touch shingles to EPDM. But there's, then everybody did it anyway, and it didn't seem to destroy the EPDM. So where it really comes into play for us, and I'll show you a little bit of this later, I have some pictures, uh, is where you have ice and water shield, which is sticky and full of solvents. And can you stick that to EPDM? Probably a bad idea. But you can actually put shingles on top of it, or felt paper. And if there's a shingle roof above, the, the residue that comes off of that's not going to No, that's not an issue. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, but you don't want to stick it or use asphalt cements 
or you know, use torch down and EPDM on the same roof. Right. Yeah, you have to use special uh, sealants and everything. Okay, so this is uh, this is the second half of the of the presentation, and so this is pretty long. We'll take a we'll take a deep breath in the middle of this. Um, but these uh, these details to me are the key because uh, these are the things that uh, when you go out on on uh, on a problem roof, um, these are the problems. All right. So first, let's talk about slope. Quarter inch per foot is what it says in all the books. It even says it in the code book. It's actually against the law to build a roof that isn't at least a quarter inch per foot, although you're not going to get caught. Um, but look at this roof. I mean, if you have a leak in the middle of this roof somewhere, uh, you're going to have, I don't know, 100, 200 gallons of water in your house. And then if you look at the other ones where they're sloped properly, if you had a leak, maybe in the middle of a rainstorm, you might get a few gallons, but rest of the time, no issue. So you know, and this roof is going to have freeze thaw issues. It's going to have lichen and moss growing, trying to peel apart the seams. I mean, this is just a disaster. So you really never have a flat roof. You really want to have at least a quarter inch per foot. Uh, if you have puddles, you're going to have leaks. So if you, you got to keep at least a quarter inch a foot. Uh, one really cool trick that we figured out is this slope kit foam makes it very easy to get slope. If you have something framed that is level, or doesn't have a quarter inch per foot, you can add slope with this. Or if you come into an existing roof, you can add lots of slope to an existing roof. Sometimes you even find existing roofs that are sloped backwards. And we can just put these slope kits on it. And what they are is sheets of foam that are tapered. You can even get them in different tapers. Th this set comes in uh, half inch to inch and a half, four feet by four feet. So it's a quarter inch per foot. And the way you put it on is you start at the bottom edge with the half inch and you run up to inch and a half. Then you put another piece that's one inch thick, and then you put another piece of those half inch to inch and a half on top of it, and it just keeps going up at a quarter inch a foot. So you're just stacking them and you go yep, up. yep. And because this roof couldn't be vented, we were using closed cell spray foam under it anyway to make a, an enclosed cavity. And it turns out that per unit of our value, this stuff was less expensive than the closed cell spray foam. So we actually saved money by using this. And it's also in the right place. It keeps the sheathing warmer, less issues of condensation. So this is a really good thing we figured out. Um, and we've used that a bunch. Um, one other thing to think about, and there's not always a great solution to this, but edges and especially uh, scuppers are going to have a lot of layers. So if there's a way to taper the roof down at the edge, it's a great thing to do. And you can just cut the edge of the rafter 3 eighths to nothing over 8 inches. And that can be enough for all those layers to be below the main roof, if you can. You can't always. Sometimes you can. So let's talk about how water is getting off of the roof. Um, this is a really big deal. Uh, they, these are the water lines on a roof where the, the drains clogged and the water got up 11 inches deep. And we're lucky that, you know, it's a lot lucky for the clients that that just didn't fall through with 11 inches of water on it. But it also barely leaked, um, which is really lucky too. So uh, in my opinion, drains get clogged, small scuppers get clogged, trees throw off an unbelievable amount of stuff around here, especially in the windy uh, thunderstorms we get in the summer, which is the heaviest rain. So those are a big deal. Um, so let me talk about a roof that we did. Um, this actually is a flat roof. It's not supposed to be flat. As I said, you really should have a quarter inch per foot. But parts of this roof were dead flat. And then it had these tiny scuppers, like five inch by five inch scuppers, um, the holes in the parapet roof. The funny thing is you can't even see that parapet from anywhere on the property. We didn't even need to have the parapet wall. It was just in the plans. Um, and then it wasn't maintained well. So. <clears throat> Uh, you can see we had some issues here. Actually, I should mention this. The roofer knew this roof was so bad, he left the bucket of asphalt cement and the trowel on the roof. Like he knew he was going to be up there fixing it again. Um, some of the seams were failing. There's patches all over it. You know, it just wasn't a very good roof. And we got a call one day. There's water coming in. And we went up there. This is what we found. Uh, you know, 35 bushels of leaves um, and two or three inches of water. 
So, so the material that's, that's covering the roof there? That, it, that's a modified bitumen roof, but it's a single layer. And as I said, there were some design issues. Um, With a single layer, you're, you're more prone to tearing and, and not right. underneath of that. So you're I think the real issue is that it, it was actually framed flat and there's no slope kit on it. So water was always there and it had freeze thaw at the seams. Yeah, it would pull, push the seams apart. <clears throat> so those tiny scuppers made it impossible for water to get off the roof once it filled up with leaves. And you see the same thing with drains. Um, even with these leaf things, the leaves will get all the way around it and you'll end up getting a, an inch or two deep puddle all the way across the roof. And uh, then you're in big trouble. Um, so in my opinion, there's kind of three different ways to drain a roof. There's the individual drains like in this picture. There's the scuppers, like in the last pictures, the holes through a parapet wall. And then there's what I call an open edge, where there's no drain or scupper. The water just goes off the edge the whole way across the roof. And to me, that's a much better way to go if you can, if you can manage that in your design. So let's talk about a drain. Here's one where someone really tried hard, did some really neat workmanship, made this special copper thing. All the water was dropping out of that into the top of this cast iron pipe. Um, why are we looking at this picture with the ceiling cut out? Well, it leaked, right? It, water was pouring out of the top of that pipe because it got clogged. It turns out about 150 feet away where some landscapers crushed the drain lines. So this is actually a really common thing to happen or a common reason why someone would call us and have an issue. Um, these lines get clogged. People, people don't like the pipe sticking out of the ground and they cover it with stuff or they just get enough leaves in them or whatever. People run over them. And uh, then the water backs up if you don't have a perfect seal between the pipe and the roofing. The water will get out into the house. I've had that issue where landscapers have buried it and cut through it. And yeah. They won't, you know, the water just won't go down. And it takes a little bit of a couple storms in a row, and then you get a call, and it's just a right. there. And finally, you trace it down and find out where it's at and fix it. But. My favorite one, the landscapers tied two lines together to, and then covered it with uh, landscape fabric and boulders to make it all look pretty. And one line was uh, the basement drain and the other was the gutters. So it, the water went down, hit their landscape fabric and went into the basement. Sweet. Um, and this is another weird one. I've seen these roof drains. This is, this is your 100-year-old house. Um, it's got a cast iron pipe that goes down and uh, this is a picture from about, about this high above the basement slab, and it just ends. I'm not sure what that is or was, or if it's just clogged, you know, 30 feet out in the yard and it's backed up to there, but that was impenetrable. There was no water leaving that drain. The way to do a drain properly is to use a clamp ring assembly and seal the roof to the top of the drain body and then clamp it with a clamp ring. And then water can't, and that has to be sealed to the pipe. Then if the pipe backs up, there's nowhere for water to get in into the house. It goes over the overflow. There's even a way to retrofit a drain that is supposed to not leak. Um, so this is a special drain. You can see the old drain here. And then this is when you drop in the top of it, and it has a seal that seals it to the pipe. And the ones that I've used before have a, uh, like a, they have these very long screws, and they screw a, a ring that compresses the rubber gasket and squeezes it out against the pipe. And it feels pretty solid. I mean, I wouldn't bet my life that it won't leak if you keep water, keep it full of water for long enough, but that's what you're supposed to do. You can't just ever have something just dropping in and not sealed because you're going to have it back up at some point. So I'm not in love with drains. Uh, Built-in gutters I view as a worse version of a drain. Um, <clears throat> There's a drain in a built-in gutter. There's no room for the clamp ring. There's no room for workmanship. Because it's a copper gutter that's like 50 feet long in that direction. Uh, I was up on this roof. You, you probably remember this house. Uh, this is how we got brought into this house. The leaks around here. But all those seams with the soldering, extra soldering you can see on it, those would rip open in the winter because it would freeze. Um, so we won't, we won't do that. But trying to solder that in the snow was, was a joke. So I don't know. I, th I just think built-in gutters are the worst of all possible worlds. Um, it's very hard to design it so it won't leak. Um, you can do it, but especially in a remodeling situation, we're usually stuck with the drain locations. And the drain locations dictate where the expansion joints have to be. And for example, on that one where the drain is right at the corner, the, the expansion joint should be in the corner. 
and you can't put it there because that's where the drain is. So it's going to be really hard. I don't think there was a solution to this other than adding another drain and going all the way down through two stories of a finished house. So uh, they're really good at leaves. Um, I think they're higher maintenance. And uh, as I said, it's hard to plan them with the expansion and contraction. So I just think they're a terrible idea. All right, so let me just um, throw out, for the purpose of this discussion, I'm going to call a hole in a wall a scupper and this beautiful contraption on the outside a receptor. Sometimes these are called receptor, uh, scuppers. So I'm, when I'm talking to a client, I might call this a scupper, like which type of scupper do you want? But for the purpose of this discussion, that's a receptor and the hole in the wall is a scupper. Okay. Um, one important thing with a receptor is if you mount it so it's two inches above where the water comes out through the wall, and then it fills up with leaves and clogs, the water is going to be two inches deep across the roof. So you really want it to be mounted below the roof level so that if, when it fills up with water or when it fills up with leaves, the water can pour out over top of it and not back up onto the roof. <clears throat> so these are these terrible scuppers. Um, this is a, an attempt to make a better scupper. It's really wide, so it should have been really hard to clog up. But because it's only four inches tall, um, it actually did still clog up, although it took a year and a half of leaf accumulation. It turns out these clients um, didn't like their landscape or the way they were taking care of the lawn, fired them, and that was the only person in their maintenance group who knew that they should have been cleaning the leaves. So a year and a half later, we got a phone call. It was clogged because there was an unbelievable amount of leaves. So to me, um, a scupper has to be about eight inches tall so you can work in it, and about 12 inches wide, so it hopefully won't clog, depending on the size. And in this case, it's almost four feet wide, but it still wasn't wide enough. Um, so you do have to still maintain your roof. And let me just step through this. This is the Firestone detail book. Um, as I said, these books are awesome. This is the easier way to do a scupper. This is if you have a welded sleeve, which is to say a piece of metal that goes all the way through the parapet wall and has all the seams completely sealed, and a three-inch flange on all sides that's also completely sealed. Uh, if you don't have a welded sleeve, if you have a sleeve with joints, then there's two more steps you do on top of all these. But uh, So you start with the welded sleeve in the upper left there. You put that on with the water stop adhesive, nail it to the wall and the roof plane. You put on a five inch seam tape vertically and then horizontally and horizontally. <clears throat> and then you come and put a nine inch piece over the bottom one. And then you cap seal all of the flashings. So that's a lot of steps. Most of the scuppers I see that other people have done, they didn't do all these steps. Uh, as I said, this is the easier one. If you, if you don't have a pre-soldered box, then you have to do even more steps. Um, and you can see the layers, you know, you have uh, roofing, metal, two layers of seam tape. I mean, it's about a quarter inch thick. So I, I, these are really complicated and you need, there needs to be room to work in them. And uh, they're, they're a trouble, troublesome, problematic area on a roof. Um, and it's better if you can just skip it. So let's talk about an open edge. Uh, there are no scuppers on this roof. It has the look of a parapet wall. But the way we did it was we put posts in the roof, and the parapet wall actually ends about four inches above the roof. You can barely see underneath there. That's the outside you're looking at. So it gave the look that we wanted. This is much easier workmanship. No 12 steps you know, for a scupper. Um, and it's much harder to clog. It's, you know, this, it's like 24 feet long. It's really hard to get enough leaves up there to do that. And then you can't really even see it from outside because of the gutter kind of hides the view of the slot. Um, overall, I think this worked out pretty well. And uh, if you really need to have a parapet wall, I think that's probably the best way to do it. Uh, in this case, um, you don't need a parapet wall. You know, most houses around here don't need one. Parapet walls are really, the, the main reason for those is to prevent the wind from sucking the EPDM off the top of a large building. Um, we don't really have that issue with residences in DC. Too many obstacles for the wind anyway. So you can just skip the parapet wall. So again, I think, uh, I think the open edge is the way to go. So this is another issue that can come up. Um, 
or should come up. Um, ideally, we don't get boxed into this in the planning phase, but if we do on the production side, we need to recognize it and deal with it. Uh, the question is, where's all the water go when we have a torrential downpour, when we have seven inches of rain in half an hour, and you have hundreds of gallons of water pouring off of the roof, and probably the gutters are clogged because it's a thunderstorm and it, all the leaves clogged up the gutters. Uh, you don't want it to be a basement stairwell. Uh, you don't want to box in your master bedroom doors and have them be the low point after the drain. Um, you got to be careful of this. And uh, this roof where the, where the guy is here, right below it is a basement area way with a questionable drain that we don't know where it goes. So in this particular instance, um, we convinced the clients to add another roof down at this level that made it so you could get in and out of the basement door without getting rained on and also any water that poured off that upper roof would get, would get away from the basement area way. So that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. Okay, take a deep breath. That's it for water, where's it going? Now let's talk about all these connections. Okay, um, so wall connections, if you look in the book, they're supposed to be eight inches tall. You can't get a warranty on a commercial roof that doesn't have eight inches from the roof surface up the wall of the roof. Um, you know, around here, I think six inches is on a residence is fine. Um, I've never ever seen an issue with six inches of rise. Uh, I would even say with a window, you know, if there's a window or a door, like I would, I would take a four inch curb under a door and a quarter inch per foot slope instead of a six inch under a door and less than a quarter inch. I think that's a fair trade off. Um, Four inch makes me kind of nervous. Three inches is not enough, in my opinion. And that's just based on DC. I mean, uh, I think if you probably talk to people in snow country, six inches might not be enough. But around here, that seems to be good. Um, this is not good enough, right? This is like two inches from the door to the roof surface. Um, that, you can't even do good workmanship under there. And that's actually one of the main issues. So here's a roof we were asked to fix. Yeah, it looks familiar. <laughs> Dante knows exactly where that is. It was so close to the roof surface that they actually kind of notched the roofing around the door trim. Um, that was a sign. I looked at that and I thought, you know, there's like an inch under the door threshold. I thought, now I wonder how they did the roofing under there. And the answer is they didn't. They just kind of folded it up and uh, didn't seal it, didn't do anything. So this, that's where this one was leaking. Uh, every time it rained, water would run down the door and under the threshold into the house. So um, I think that's one of the big issues with a lack of clearance is you can't get your fingers in there to manipulate the roofing to do a good job with it. So uh, on a wall connection, uh, when you're attaching to masonry, you're gonna wanna use what's called a termination bar. It's a strong piece of aluminum that you nail or you fasten into the wall and that clamps the roofing to the wall. You seal the top of it and then you add another flashing over top of it, which is cut into the masonry. So overall, it looks like that. That's a good solid connection. Um, <clears throat> as long as not too much water goes through the masonry, which definitely happens on old brick. And how do you join that flashing? Just make some adhesive or certain How do you attach it to the wall? You mean, um, well, there's different ways. You can actually nail it every so often. Sometimes people do that. You can wedge it with pieces of aluminum. And then at the end of the day, the sealant will pretty much hold it. So. Yeah. So that's just like a curve cut in there and then slid. Mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then you can see that piece is bent back around. So that's, that's, it's wedged in there. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And uh, our standard for that kerf is that it should be three quarters of an inch deep. And, uh, you know, it's hard to do an even nice job and get the metal all the way back there the whole way. But if you're shooting for three quarter, you'll probably get a half. I think a half works. It's when you're shooting for a half and you get a quarter and then the sun hits it and it bends out a little bit, that's when you have issues. So three quarters of an inch in. We used to say one inch, but then we realized that was getting into the cores on the cord bricks. Um, this is how you deal with siding. You put a piece of metal that covers the roofing, um, run the roofing up and stick it to the wall and put a piece of, of metal flashing. That'll hold it. You don't necessarily need um, the termination bar if you have uh, a, good, a, a lot of fasteners 
on a smooth wall that's easy to nail to. And most of our roofing materials are supposed to be a, uh, a minimum distance above the roof. And uh, usually it's only like two inches, but if you're cl that close to the roof, it's gonna be impossible to change the roofing without ripping the, the finishes off. So this is a roof we were looking at. This Obviously this joint is open, we shoved that key in there. Um, if we had to replace that roof, that would have been bad enough for the clients, but then we also would have had to get into stucco and it just would have spiraled. It would have been a very expensive job because the stucco is so close to the roof. So instead of doing that, we should do something like this, add a piece of metal. And I just took this from the James Hardy book. Um, they have a two inch clearance minimum, which looks really goofy. But if you bend up a piece of aluminum and put it under the siding, uh, it looks really good. So that gives you your clearance and it allows you some space to work the roof in and out in the future if you need to. So you can do that with all different types of materials. Um, so here's another issue with the asphalt. Uh, you, um, if you have a door or window that's close to an EPDM roof, you're gonna run the EPDM into the door and window opening to make a pan. So, because you don't wanna have a whole different set of materials in there. But then when you go to tape and seal in the window, you can't use asphalt-based materials. You gotta use a butyl tape uh, and sealants that are compatible with EPDM. So the easy way to know that is all the DuPont tapes and are butyl, so just buy those. Um, you can look it up for some other material, but that's an easy way to remember. All right, we're most of the way through our key details. Let's talk about penetrations. Um, yeah, I have actually seen this a lot. People try to knock something together. Most of the time it works, but not every time. And uh, if you're doing a membrane roof, I mean, why not buy the EPDM boot from the factory? That's going to work every time. So that's what it says in the book. Use those. Don't try to glue something together yourself with flashings and hope it holds. Um, any rectangular shape you flash, uh, you can use the same details they have for skylight curbs. It's basically a set of layers. Um, this uh, pitch pocket is another way of doing penetrations. And uh, I think this maybe made more sense um, with other styles of roofing but it's actually very expensive. And there's a bunch of steps that I think most of the guys I've worked with aren't aware of. You're supposed to prime all the surfaces before you pour it. Um, you're, you, so you, be, you build a little hole and then you fill it with this liquid and it cures, but you're also supposed to slope the top of the material and prime everything first. And it's just a pain. Um, it doesn't look very good and it's expensive. So uh, it's better to use the boots if you can. Um, yeah, there's really no reason to use those. All right, um, talked a little bit about this, but particularly on membrane roofs, you're gonna have metal around the perimeter. Um, so <clears throat> it's important because the joints are gonna move and the joints are gonna open, in my opinion, it's much better to always have the membrane run under it when you can. So here's an example of a roof that has a metal at the edge and someone's already tried to fix this more than once. Uh, and we were called down on this thing. We tore it up and sure enough, here's a huge area of rot, which was caused because water was getting in this joint and running down the lower piece of metal and then getting in. So instead of running it that way, and here's another example, um, you know, the, when you go up on a roof and someone's already put goop all over everything, you know they did it wrong the first time. So, I mean, you can see those pieces of metal, they aren't even touching, that's not watertight. Uh, and someone's already tried to caulk it. Well, sure enough, if you look in the books, they have a detail where you run the membrane before you put the drip edge on. You run all the way to the edge and down with the membrane, and you put the drip edge on top of it, and then you tape in the top of the metal. And in my opinion, that's gonna work much better. We've only been doing this for a few years. Uh, I'm not, you know, it'll be another 10 or 15 years before I know whether this works great or if there's some flaws with it, but I know this will work better than running the metal first and then putting the roof membrane on top of it. All right. So uh, these edge connections, um, this is an example of it. You run the membrane over, then the metal, then you strip, strip in the top of the metal. And uh, here's uh, a TPO roof. This is actually an example of them using a the heat gun. Um, he's heating up that corner flashing and sticking it in place. And they did a really nice job on the edge with this. Here's the membrane going over the edge. And they actually did something very unusual here. They actually rabbited out the edge of the plywood with a planer so that the, all the built up edge would, wouldn't raise up above. And uh, then they ran their main membrane over the edge and then they put the metal and the seam tape on top. It looks beautiful. So that's a, that's a really nice 
nicely done edge. Um, it's not that much more expensive either. This parapet wall is very similar. The pieces of metal on top of parapet walls, um, that's not watertight, right? Part of it is watertight now, part of it isn't. The rest of it won't be later like this one. Um, these pieces just move too much. So there's no really good way to seal them. You're, you're waiting for the caulk to fail. And then when it does, if you don't have anything under it, it's going into the building. So again, going to the book, um, you can see they recommend that you run the membrane all the way up over the top of the parapet wall and down the other side, and then cap that with the metal. So that's a much better way to do it. Uh, in an ideal world, you even actually pitch the top of the wood framing a little bit, and then the slope, there'll be slope on the membrane and water won't be able to pool on top of that. And then a skylight is a similar situation to that, although skylights have some issues that can make it even worse. Um, here's an example of a skylight we had some issues with. Uh, this one, I think it was leaking from inside and outside. Um, skylights do get wet on the inside, you know, like when it's zero degrees outside, there's going to be condensation on the inside face, and that's going to run down the sloped part of the skylight and drip off. Now this is, this, is, uh, this is an indoor pool, so there's a lot more water on this one than a normal skylight. But uh, this is what you can get. And then most of these curb-mounted skylights, they, you, you put pieces of aluminum on top of the curb, and, but water is going to drip on that. And if it's not watertight, which it probably won't be, then you need something else under the aluminum. In this case, all the aluminum joints were leaking. The pieces, you know, the joints between the two pieces. And on top of which, this was a kind of a heavy, large commercial skylight, and they bolted the, their structural, I mean, lag bolts going through, and that sucked the metal down, and that was the low point on the curb, so water leaked in around all the bolts. Um, the way we fixed it is we pitched the actual top of the curb. We ran the EPDM all the way over to the, on top of the inside finishes, so anything that leaks in will drip off the inside finishes onto the floor, or in this case, into the pool. And then we put this piece of aluminum on that, that had a, a upturn on the inside. It turned down to cover the edge of the rubber, and then it turned down on the outside. And then we sealed the back of it, the inside edge of it, to the top of the curb and left everything else open so water could go outside. Uh, here's another skylight in a copper roof. Uh, it was leaking. We thought it was at the bottom where it ties in, uh, so we put up a little curb. This is kind of neat, actually. Um, I didn't even realize you could do this. We just made this frame and duct taped it to the copper and uh, filled it up with water. It's even red, nice red duct tape, kind of cool. Um, held water like this for a couple hours, no leaks. So we popped the skylight off. Well, this is what the curb looks like. So it's a flat roof. You get a heavy rainstorm, you get a lot of splashing. Water was just splashing up off the roof, going over the top edge of the metal. So we fixed that. Um, and you can see all the way around. Uh, we fixed that by sealing the top edge and then putting some peel and stick on top uh, and then covering that with aluminum. This is an example of the aluminum joints that I think are going to leak. I think that's going to leak. Uh, so this is supposed to be holding water if any, any condensation drips, and that's not going to hold any water. So again, it's better to do what the book says, run the EPDM all the way over and down the inside, and then you're safe. And there's a very, very neat TPO skylight corner. The details they have in these books are awesome. And then when you see guys actually do it, and it looks so perfect. It just makes, really warms my heart. So for skylights, uh, this is for curb-mounted skylights. You're going to go up and over the curb. Um, you're, there's going to be condensation. The joints in the aluminum are going to leak. You've got to plan for all that stuff. And uh, the other thing that actually Dante and I were talking about earlier, um, you want to make sure you slope a skylight because you never want to have water puddling on top of it and collecting debris and looking bad. It's just it's an aesthetic issue. It's not going to make it leak. But you always want to have as much slope as you reasonably can on even a curb-mounted skylight. OK, another detail area, transitions to high slope roofs. Um, this is straight out of the Firestone book. You know, you're coming across your low slope roof. You turn up, and here's your shingles, as you were talking about. Now, they're, they're showing a piece of aluminum between the shingles and the EPDM, so they aren't actually touching. And I think that's a good detail. And they also show a minimum of 8-inch rise on the EPDM. Now, I don't think that's enough. 
And this is one of the reasons why I don't think it's enough. And this is another, and this is another. Because we, this is stuff, I mean, why was I on these roofs taking pictures? Because they were leaking. Um, I think you need to have an ice dam protection area because low, low slope roofs will hold snow and leaves. And you really need an ice dam at that, at that transition. Uh, this is a, a roof. Um, we were in the middle of construction. I happened to show up this one day, existing EPDM roof. And then our guys just put ice and water shield down on top of it. It had maybe three inches of rise. I mean, that's nowhere near enough. And also, you shouldn't really stick ice dam membrane to EPDM. Um, so what we did was we extended the EPDM. Here's an example of a place where you, you couldn't see this roof. So we just ran the EPDM way up the roof. And instead of having the shingles come all the way down, we just had the shingles come much less of the way down. So the EPDM kind of worked as its own ice dam membrane. Here's an example of running it partway up the roof and using the peel and stick, but leaving the plastic on. And then we used, I think we used a sealant of some kind to prevent water from going up. And uh, actually, um, Grace makes a butyl-based ice and water guard that can be stuck to EPDM. So that might be the easiest way to deal with all this. But you want to go up you know, a minimum of 8-inch vertical rise uh, if you're using something like that. And I think you want to look more like 16 or 24 inches vertical uh, if you're not going to use a sticky material on it. OK, you made it. That's all the details that I've seen leak. I got a couple more things I wanted to uh, talk about or ask about. So this is one that I find to be really puzzling. Um, I, I think vented roofs are by far the best way to go whenever you can. Um, my opinion, most roofs are going to leak under some circumstances, you know, torrential downpour, ice dam. Um, when it wears out, people don't replace roofs when they look bad. They replace them when water comes into their house. So to me, a vented roof is much better. It allows the sheathing and the joists or rafters to dry um, when there's a leak. And if you don't vent the roof, um, you can have all kinds of problems that you wouldn't have if you have ventilation. But in a remodeling situation, um, you know, we, we build a lot of flat roof, low slope roof additions that are enclosed on two or three sides. And I just don't think they can be vented. So <clears throat> until someone comes up with a great idea, um, we're stuck with using spray foam on the inside of them. Um, one of the things that I think can help in certain regards is using insulation on top of the sheathing. Um, that doesn't help when you do have a leak, but it does keep the sheathing warmer so you don't have condensation on the sheathing the way you can otherwise. Uh, one other design aspect is what are you doing with all the downspouts, particularly when we're adding an addition to a house and there's downspouts coming down the house. Um, this is something it's everything else being equal, it's better to discuss ahead of time. Um, when you have a downspout from an upper roof that lands on a lower roof, um, it just adds a lot of complications, a lot of water, a lot of debris. Um, in this case, the aluminum downspout actually cut through the roof uh, that's, I haven't seen that too often, but it can happen. So really it's better if you can move the downspouts away from the low slope roof, if that's possible. Um, I, I also really don't love having a hole through the roof, especially if it's going into a finished space. That seems really sketchy. So let me summarize here. Um, you want to use, I think it's best to use a membrane roof for a low slope roof, I'm not in love with the metal ones. Um, I think it's much better to have an open edge on that roof instead of using scuppers or drains. Uh, I think you want to get a quarter inch per foot slope if you possibly can and try to keep six inches at the walls if you can't get eight. And then uh, definitely come look at those manuals. I have a bunch of them at my desk for whatever you're looking for. All right, any questions on any of that? So you think that PPO roofing system is, is probably better than I think it's pretty good. I mean, EPDM is good too, as long as you maintain the seams. Um, had good success with both of those. Yeah. Yep. But TPO is good um, if you have a good installation crew. Yeah. Yeah. I think I've done two, two that they use the TPO and, and the guys are decent with it and uh, haven't had any issues with them that I've heard of yet. But. That's good. That's good because uh, it's pretty easy to make a mistake on a low slope roof, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Great. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate the time.